Hi everyone and welcome to this module for the course Comparative Programming Languages. So uh, in this video I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the language of WebAssembly. Let's get into it. So I'm going to start out this presentation with a question. So would you allow anyone on the internet to run arbitrary code on your machine? So if you want to think about this for a second, go ahead. But I think most of you would know or have the answer in your head by now. I think if you're a little bit aware of what you can do when running code on someone's machine, I think most of you would be hesitant to allow this. But in fact, all of us, we visit web pages. And when we visit web pages, well, your browser loads the page, so code is being executed. Your browser, first of all, is executing code. The code that your browser is, executed, is executing depends, for example, on the HTML of this page. Even worse, um, it, the browser might even load code from the web page itself and start running this on your computer. I think most of you know this, but if you visit a website, it's possible that some JavaScript code is being executed on your computer. Arbitrary JavaScript code. Or, well, it used to be more popular than today, but used to be the case that you have Flash, um, a Flash applet. So um, Flash had an entirely, uh, had a complete programming language in there. It could execute almost any code. It could execute um, during complete programs in ActionScript. Java applets, same thing, same story. But as I mentioned before, even if you disable Java, if you disable Flash, if you disable JavaScript, still you're executing code because you visit a website, the HTML parser of your web browser is going to parse line by line the HTML of the website and it's going to take a certain path through its own code. So I would not call this arbitrary code, but something on the web is causing your machine to take different directories in its own code base, depending on what exactly is in that website. Now you might ask me, well, sure. I visit a simple HTML page, no JavaScript, no code. Can, can this go wrong? What's the problem? And the answer is, yes, this can still go wrong. This is still not necessarily secure. And let me just show you by example. So what I have open here on my computer is a web page. And whenever security vulnerabilities are reported, this is typically done in term in uh, with a CVE. And this website is a database and you can search through CVEs that have been reported in the past. So um, I've taken a look at a few random CVEs and I've searched for arbitrary code execution JavaScript. I got a lot of results. So let's read one. So uh, this one, for example, Firefox 38 and Firefox ESR 38 allow user assisted remote attackers to read arbitrary files or execute arbitrary JavaScript code with Chrome privileges via a crafted website that is accessed with unspecified mouse and keyboard actions. Next one, the SM.js implementation in Firefox before 38 does not properly determine heap lengths during identification of cases in which bounce checking may be safely skipped, which allows remote attackers to trigger out of bound write operations and possibly execute arbitrary code or trigger out of bounds read operations and possibly obtain sensitive information from process memory via crafted JavaScript. So here's an example of a few things that can go wrong when running JavaScript. And actually there's many more. So simply the search for code execution, arbitrary code execution JavaScript gave me 520 results. So um, simply executing JavaScript still can expose you to arbitrary code execution, but it doesn't stop there. Let me change 
this from JavaScript to, for example, HTML. 470 CVA entries. So, um, let's see. Insufficient data validation in developer tools in Google Chrome prior to the version 81 allowed the remote attacker who had convinced the user to use DevTools to execute arbitrary code via a crafted HTML page. So no, no JavaScript here, nothing, just simple HTML. This one, type confusion in V8, in Google Chrome prior to 84, again, allowed a remote attacker to execute arbitrary code inside of a sandbox, luckily, via a crafted HTML page. And you can find many more examples. Actually, a parser application, such as an HTML parser, is typically vulnerable. It's difficult to write a perfect parser for any possible inputs that you get. Um, and so there is a big history of arbitrary code execution from many different um, technologies. So now when I ask you the question, can this go wrong? Your answer is obviously going to be yes, of course. Security is just an illusion. Visiting a website is not a safe thing to do. Luckily, exploiting certain vulnerabilities is still a very difficult job and not every website on the internet is trying to attack you. But in general, consider security an illusion. You don't really have security. It's not because you're running the latest OS in the latest browser with the latest updates that you're now secure. No. In a year or two, we will know all of the vulnerabilities in the current versions of Mozilla Firefox, of Google Chrome, of all of the software of your Linux kernel, of your Windows machine. Security is just an illusion. Let's see where these problems start, in my opinion, or from my perspective. So I think the essence boils down to a very simple concept. Humans write programs and writing a correct program is very, very hard. It's even hard often to simply define what correct means. So programming, while it might be easy for you to get a certain thing working, it's much more difficult for you to say, does this work under every possible circumstance? Will this program execute as I expect it to do? with every possible input value, for example, under any possible constraints in terms of resources. And it's a very, very difficult job. And secondly, the popular languages that we use, they don't necessarily make this job easier for us. So they might not be necessarily part of the problem, but they don't help us solve the problem either. So the language like C from exists already since 1972. So it's a very, very old design. This design couldn't possibly predict the ways um, in, in which attacks would be constructed 40, 50 years later. Same goes with JavaScript. JavaScript couldn't possibly predict the ways in which it's used today. And the design of JavaScript happened by one person in a few days in the 90s. So, Here's some problems we need to solve. Again, where do these problems start? Um, why is it so hard to write something correctly? And um, why is it so hard or why isn't even when we have so many people, so many programmers in the world working on securing stuff, why isn't everything already so secure after 50 years of development? And so let me give you a, a perspective, a way of looking at this, a, a very simple one, which is often used in security research. And let's just look at the lines of code. What, let's take the example JavaScript. When we visit the website, JavaScript code from some random programmer is being executed on our machine. And we don't want to trust this JavaScript code this Java code necessarily. We want our browser to make sure that the Java code cannot do anything wrong on our machine, this JavaScript. But 
let's take a look at this browser. For example, the browser Google Chrome. So Google Chrome, in the, I've, I've taken a look, so has around 30 million lines of code. The engine that runs JavaScript itself, V8 is a small part of this, has about a million lines of code. But Google Chrome is a program written in a low level language, probably C or C++. So let's take a look at a typical compiler, GCC, that compiles C to a machine language. This also exists or consists of 14 million lines of code. And so whenever this source level program is being translated to a machine language coded uh, program, it needs to pass through this 14 million lines of code. Uh, maybe not all of them, but it's in this code base, the translation happens of this 30 million lines of code um, browser. Then this result, this x86 code, for example, let's say you're having an Intel i7 processor, you're running the x86 instruction set architecture. So your browser is being compiled from C and C++ to x86 using this huge compiler program. And then it runs on top of your kernel, which is another 30 million lines of code. So this kernel is then responsible for securing um, your browser and isolating your browser from the other processes on your machine. 30 million lines of code. And then that runs on top of hardware. And this hardware is so complex. It's millions of millions of transistors being built, new features being added every year, complexity being added year after year. Um, but who still has an oversight here? The message I want to I want to give here is this is incredibly complex and can you be convinced that there are no mistakes in here and um, if you've taken some security lessons you could know that just a few errors in any of these lines of code could allow you to get through the next level so javascript could break out of the v8 engine it's then still contained by the chrome browser process but then it could make a find a vulnerability maybe in the compilation process of the browser or maybe in the linux kernel and break out of that kernel and then he'd have arbitrary code execution and these things happen this is not necessarily unrealistic these things happen it's very very difficult to get all of this huge code base to get this secure so as i mentioned a mistake in these millions of lines of codes and mistakes are going to happen, they lead to vulnerabilities. So now let's think about security research or what a security researcher should do. Our goal in security is to, to reduce mistakes um, on the one hand and to also limit the impact a vulnerability can have. So you have a few separate approaches and I want to focus uh, upon some of them. So the first one I want to focus on is sandboxing. The concept of a sandbox. This is a very beautiful sandbox that's being drawn here on your screen. And it has millions of millions of grains of sand in there. Probably trillions or even more. None of the sand in this picture has escaped from the border. Because we built a nice box around it. Built a wall around it. So to contain it. So that's the principle of sandboxing. And sandboxing happens in this entire stack. Your processor, it tries to sandbox using, for example, uh, your operating system tries to use your processor and virtual memory, for example, to sandbox different processors from each other, to place them all in, in isolation from each other. So, um, but also JavaScript inherently JavaScript is executed within a sandbox. So, as I mentioned before, JavaScript code cannot execute anything on your PC. It, it, happens, it happens to execute within a sandbox provided by Google Chrome or Firefox in the V8 engine. And so this is a security mechanism that says things can definitely go wrong, but we will put it inside of a box so that 
If it goes wrong, everything still goes wrong inside of the box. Escaping sandboxes is something that attackers love to do. And the problem becomes even more difficult when you realize you in real, li in real life you have children and they go inside of the sandbox and they get out of there again. You could consider this input and output inside of your... There, there's a, there's a, an API, you go in the sandbox, you go out, how are you sure no sand escapes from the box? This is a bit of a, well of course a metaphor, but it's quite realistic. It's, it's very difficult to, on the one hand, isolate something and on the other hand still communicate with this thing, for example. But my main point here is that sandboxing is one technique and that technique is basically saying stuff is going to go wrong and if it does go wrong, well, we contain it. So what about avoiding mistakes? When we send a rocket into space, this rocket is running security critical code. And rockets, as you probably know by now, have exploded in the past due to programming errors. We simply cannot sandbox this code if it's steering the rockets, because if it goes wrong, the rocket is going to go down. You cannot sandbox this. You cannot sandbox everything. And also, sandboxes are not perfect. So, we need also a way to reduce mistakes. So at Kai Leuve, for example, we have Very Fast, which is a, a logic-based tool. And with this logic-based tool, you can write proofs about C code. Um, you can prove certain properties of C code. You might have seen this already very fast or not. And similarly, we have CompCert, for example which is a formally verified to be correct compiler for a subset of C. So there have been mathematical proofs made that this compiler is actually a correct compiler. And so when I talked earlier about this huge code base of GCC, of, uh, which is responsible from translating the Chrome browser to the machine code, which can contain errors, well, you could write compilers like CompCert, which works for a subset of C, but the translation is proven to be correct. And I haven't defined here what correct is yet, and I'm not going to go into that. But you have these formal methods that try to make strong statements about, for example, unsafe programming language languages to try to reduce errors, reduce mistakes, catch mistakes before they occur. There's many different, there's many other techniques I've, I haven't mentioned here. There's also a different trajectory. So you can also, to reduce mistakes, programming languages can actually help here. Proofs can be embedded in the type system of a program. If you're taking formal systems, type systems, for example, in general, are a very good way of avoiding mistakes. JavaScript has doesn't have um, a good type system. There's types in Java, but um, this type system is not used for many... Uh, how many times have you had a JavaScript compiler complain to you? Probably never, because you've probably never compiled JavaScript, but uh, the, the type system of JavaScript doesn't catch many mistakes. A good type system will tell you your program is incorrect before you execute it. It's a sort of way of proving stuff that there's good or bad about your code. So you can improve programming languages and you've seen this. So you have seen Rust. This is what one of the other languages being discussed. And uh, Rust is a low level language like C with a much more strong type system. And so when you execute a Rust program, there's going to be the chances of it having mistakes and then i don't mean mistakes as in the programmer wrote implemented the function wrong because no matter what language you use you cannot change this the fact that you can write wrong things but for example memory vulnerabilities in rust buffer overreads stuff like that you will not have buffer vulnerabilities you your type system prevents you from doing stuff wrong by forcing you to adhere to certain rules. So my takeaway here is 
Languages can help you. Languages can help you reduce mistakes. Sandboxing can help you contain mistakes. Languages can help you reduce them. And in this way, I want to introduce the language WebAssembly. Hopefully, WebAssembly will help. So, let me first give you a brief history of the language.